Okay, well, I have some of my favorite people with me this morning. Um, I think that you probably know most of them, but just in case, um, first we have Amy Scrivanis here. Amy leads our women's ministry across all of our campuses. Uh, so she is not only my boss, but also one of my best friends. She hates it when I say that. So, I mean, not the best friend part, the boss part. So I do it anytime um, I get a chance. And then, you know, Rachel Bass, who's been teaching for us, and Carrie Helmick. So I'm so glad to have you guys here today and just to help us wrap up our panel. So you guys submitted some questions, and we just want to take a few minutes and talk about those today. Um, so let's just jump in. First, how can I set up a reward system so that I'm differentiating between expected chores that are contributing to the family versus doing extra things to earn rewards. Because, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but my kids were like, if they did anything, they are like, am I getting paid for that? I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> go look at your room. Like, open the fridge, all those kinds of things. So, what do you guys have on that? Well, I failed at this, so I'm gonna pass. Me too, I didn't even submit an answer. <laughs> I didn't either. Okay, Carrie, it's on you. It's on you. Try again? Yeah, just hold okay. it close. Okay. Um, so I would like to just clarify that there's so many different ways to do or not do chores in your house. And that as I was thinking about this, none of my friends do it the same way that I do. And some don't even have their kids do chores. So there's more than one like right way to do it. But I will tell you what we've done so that you can at least have some, you can... <laughs> Pick what you like or don't like. Um, so in our family, my kids do assigned chores Monday through Friday um, to help around the house. And these are kind of like, I would say, life skills that I would like them to know. So for example, like each of them clean a bathroom one day a week and unload the dishwasher one day a week and do some sort of laundry, like um, fold a load of towels or match socks. I really don't like matching socks. So when I do laundry, I throw all the socks in a basket and a kid matches them every one day a week, which is my favorite. Um, and then um, they also vacuum something. Um, and then because there's five and that was only four chores, they repeat one of those. So I assign these at like the beginning of the school year and we have a chart which helps because then um, I don't have to think about it every day and be like, what needs to be done? I just have to think about it one time a year. <laughs> and like, then it's assigned and it gets done. This has also helped because then my husband, on days that I work, he can, because I work a 12 hour shift, so I'm gone like the whole day. He can be like, have you done your chore? And he doesn't have to remember what the chore is or think of what it should be. And it has helped because it was important for me that my kids were not excited for me to go to work because they didn't have to do chores that day. <laughs> so it allows us both to be on the same page um, for that. And um, do you want me to keep going? Sure. Okay. Um, we do give our kids a small allowance. We've chosen not to connect that to their chores though there's good reasons to connect it to their chores. We've just used it as like a money management tool. Um, but like in the summertime when they, or if they're looking for extra ways to earn money, um, I have made a list of like extra things to do with a price by it, which is like one to three dollars, <laughs> like low, but like organizing a drawer in the kitchen or wiping down the cabinet faces or something like that, that I'll give them like, I don't know, 50 cents a cabinet or something like that um, if they want to make extra chores, but those are optional. Yeah, I love that. Carrie is the person that we all wish we were, right? <laughs> yeah, way to go. Um, I was the person who, like, I love creating a system and then I'm not very good at following through on it. Yes. So I created a lot of chore systems and didn't really run any of them. Um, and so I was just kind of frustrated all the time because 
um, I would get frustrated that I was the only one who, who seeing what needed to be done and doing anything about it. I mean, my kids did some stuff, but we didn't have a good system. Like Carrie said, I will tell you what I wish I had done is run a better system when they're younger, teach them how to do those things. But then I wish that I had t taught my kids and maybe also my husband um, how to notice what needs to be done. <laughs> and I mean, seriously, because your kids walk in a room and they're like, what? It looks fine. They don't see the dust that's on the tables. They don't like, they just, they don't know. And so part of that is teaching your kids and your husband how to share your, not just your workload, but your mental load. So as your kids get a little bit older, maybe they're responsible for a bathroom or for keeping kind of your main living area picked up. And maybe that looks like you walking in with them and say, okay, I want you to start learning how to notice what needs to be done rather than just doing what I tell you to do. Because then eventually, eventually is the key word, there's a lot of training that goes into this, but eventually they do that without you even having to like give them direction. Then you can say, hey, we've got company coming over. I need you guys to help me clean up. And instead of having to constantly say, do this, do this, do this, do this, they begin to notice what needs to be done. And that means as an adult, maybe they'll notice. There's a long stretch. I mean, I got to say, there's a long stretch when mine were teenagers that my strategy was, I'm just not going upstairs. <laughs> That's okay for a season two. <laughs> not forever, but it did work for a season. Okay. Until you uh, can't ignore the smell. And Yeah. Yeah. Chuck would go upstairs and he'd come down mad and I'm like, well, why'd you go up there? <laughs> so for a season that works as well. Um, okay, what are some of your top tips to foster obedience for the two and three year old toddler stage, especially when they're stubborn and defiant? So I just wanna start this off by saying they won't always be this age. Hang in there. Some of this is just normal for the stage. Like I think the reason that this two and three year old stage is hard is because they are, their internal language way exceeds what they can express in words. And so it's real frustrating for them because they can't communicate well with you. So my first piece of advice is hang in there, know that this is, pretty normal and know that it will get better. Who has something better than that to say? <laughs> I don't have anything better than that. <laughs> I think that's very, very true. Um, but I will say that I think that consistency is super important here. I was not good at consistency with the whole reward system thing, but I did really try to be consistent in this area because if you aren't, then you're teaching your kids just to keep pushing those boundaries. So I was I always try to be very careful not to make threats that I didn't follow through on. And um, so one of the ways that we did this was like with our kids, we taught them from a very young age that if we asked them to do something or to stop doing something or we told them to do something, um, that their first answer from the time they could talk was yes, ma'am, and do it. And that's, we just started teaching that from the beginning. Now, they didn't always do that, but that was kind of, that was the expectation is that they say, yes, ma'am, and they do it. So it might be that when, you know, Sophie's two, I'm saying, Sophie, let's clean up your toys. And I wanted her to say, yes, ma'am. And then we would do that together. Um, and so we really worked hard at that. And then as they got older, I did give them the opportunity. So say that Sophie's playing with something and I'm like, hey, Sophie, it's time to clean up the toys. I still wanted her to say yes, ma'am, first to show that she is obedient, that she's paying attention and gonna do what I'm asking. But I did give them the opportunity to say, hey, can I finish building this one thing that I'm working on? And I would say, sure, you've got whatever was a reasonable time. You got five minutes to do that and then let's clean up. So that way it didn't feel like it was so controlling that they could never do their thing. But 
Um, but it just taught them this attitude of, hey, when we ask you to do something, we expect you to respond. Um, and, and even that verbal answer, I think, is a response that just shows, hey, we're communicating with one another here. And that's a, that teaches a skill there. Yeah, yeah. What about you guys? Um, hi, Softy here. Um, not great at the discipline all the time, but um, I think that was part of God's preparation for the kids he gave me. Um, so I want to encourage you to ask for discernment and wisdom from the Lord. Like, is this an obedience problem? They are sinful children. They are going to be defiant. But also, is there something more going on? So with our, our boys, we found there were actually two other issues. Um, our oldest son had some hearing issues because he had so much fluid in his ears and needed um, tubes. And once those tubes were in and he could hear what we were asking him to do, lo and behold, he actually was a pretty compliant child. Um, he just literally couldn't hear us for a couple of years. And then... Our other son has some auditory processing issues. And so if you think of those little mazes that the marbles are in and you, like, try to get it from one end to the other, his marble gets lost sometimes in between hearing something and processing what he has heard. And so we would say, go get your shoes. And, like, ten minutes later, we would be hunting through the house for him, and he'd be in a costume playing with Legos. And after a little while of... Uh, that creating meltdowns and issues, we started noticing it's not that he has a hard heart. He's literally not sure what we're asking him to do, which led to some speech therapy and some other therapies for him to kind of retrain his brain so that he can hear things and then process them a little bit faster. Um, but I'm thankful that I'm a little bit of a softie because I don't know how long it would have taken us to get there if I had been, like, rigid. Um, yeah, it would have been super frustrating. Yeah. Because, like, he literally couldn't get better yeah. at what you were wanting him to get better yeah. at. So, yeah, so I think you make a really good point. Like, it should, over time, get better. Mm -hmm. If it's not, maybe let's look deeper rather than just getting, than just, like, buckling down and getting harsher, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So, Carrie, what about just kids kind of with different personalities? So I have a real soft spot for stubborn and defiant children because <laughs> I identify myself as one. Um, and maybe as a stubborn and defiant adult, really. Um, so I do think that it's important to even frame this as like, I used to think of strengths and weaknesses like on a balance, like a scale, and you have strengths on one side and weaknesses on the other, and you kind of just hope that you have more strengths than weaknesses. But as an adult, I feel like I've come to understand weaknesses as strengths in excess. So it's more like a bar graph, mm -hmm. and if it's up till this point, this willingness to think for yourself and not just follow the crowd and not just do whatever somebody tells you is actually a real strength but it can get a little extra and when it's extra you just have to like tame it down a little bit you don't have to like get rid of that quality or that character trait because um, knowing right from wrong and knowing when to step in and when to question things like these all reflect God's character too. Mm -hmm. So just to frame that, um, so as a person that doesn't always like to be told what to do and respond to that real well, um, I think some kids respond better to choices, like, we need to leave soon. Would you like to put your shoes on first or your coat? So it still, like, gets you in the same direction, but they can, they feel like they have some choice in that. Um, or some kids respond better to understanding why rather than just, well, I'm in charge. Um, and there are times, like when your kid's running into the street, for example, where it is important for them to listen to what you're saying and respond without understanding why. So it's, I don't want to set up the expectation that they always can understand why before they respond to you. But some situations allow the time and space to understand why, and I think that's helpful. 
Um, and then I think just being clear with your expectations that if you tell a kid, if you choose A, then this will happen. And then when they choose A, follow through with that and be okay with that choice that they've made. Yeah, yeah. I do think that giving choices at this age, like this is the first stage that they're starting to realize, oh, like I can have a choice here. That's why you hear no all the time because they're trying to begin to exert this will that they're realizing that they have. So if you can give them choices, like Carrie said, here's the, here's the thing. If you can find this sweet spot of giving them just two choices, not three, not five, not too many, but two choices, and you're okay with either one of those, you win. Like, you both win because they get to choose, but you don't care if they put their coat on first or their shoes on first, but they feel like they're getting a choice, and so that can be really helpful. So let's talk about just even older kids, not just in that two to three range, but even older kids who, um, when you discipline them, they just don't seem to care about being disciplined. Like, it just doesn't really make any difference. Amy, what do you, th what do you have to say? I think that every kid has something they want. And so figuring out what that is, kind of what is the thing that they're wanting or that will kind of get to them. So um, for example, when the kids were little, um, I knew that like with my son, if he is misbehaving, it was as easy as taking one of his toys that he loves and setting it on top of the fridge where he couldn't play with it anymore. That would get him, and he would snap back into, oh, okay, I'm gonna do what I, what I know is right. Um, now, I know other kids, that doesn't get to them at all. My brother, I suggested this to him. He told me, Amy, I have all the toys on top of the fridge and nothing's <laughs> changing. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that you gotta find what, what what's valuable to your kid in that. And, um, and work with that because they're valuing something there. It might be time, you know, that they get to spend playing a game or with friends or whatever. And usually you can also, a lot of times you can tie it to the behavior. And so there might be something that is happening where they are treating someone um, just not kind in a, in a play situation. Well, with their siblings say, well, then you might need to remove them from that. They don't get the privilege of playing with their sibling and getting to have all that fun anymore that they were wanting to have because they're causing problems. And so just even thinking about how do I tie it to what's happening? Yeah, I wanna go back to consistency for a second too because I think that for some kids, they what they want is they want to please you or they want the specific toy that they love or they want something like that. There are some kids who want to see if they can get a rise out of you. <laughs> For real. Like, that's what they're trying to figure out. So what I would say is when you feel like nothing is working, one of my first questions would be, have you picked one thing and stuck with it for a little while? Because... I, I told you I was real good at creating things, but not real good at like sticking with a system or a consequence or anything like that. I would, I would try a bunch of different, different things. And I think sometimes what that communicates to your kid who's real curious, maybe we've heard a couple of Carrie Helmick stories along this line, um, is, oh, well, she did something different this time. I wonder what she did, would do next time if I tried this again. So they keep trying it just to see what's gonna happen. So what I would say is try something consistently and give it a chance to work before you say, this isn't working, I need to try something different. Carrie, what about um, just consequences? And I know it's easy also to, in the heat of the moment, um, to say, okay, well I gave them one consequence and that didn't, result in them being sorry, so I'm going to just keep piling on consequences. Yeah. Talk to us about that. I think that consequences can help our kids connect their actions to how it affects other people, but a consequence is not intended to keep our kids from sinning from that point on. It just doesn't work like that, and it's an unrealistic expectation. So I think that that can't be 
the measure of the success of a consequence. And we see this in scripture when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness <clears throat> for 40 years, that God, um, they were, it, this was like a, a punishment that they were wandering for 40 years because the, of the spies and the land, anyway, okay. So they were wandering for 40 years, but God was still with them. And it talks in Exodus about how their feet didn't swell and their shoes didn't wear out and their clothes didn't wear out and that God provided manna for them those 40 years. So God was still with them, even though there was this consequence of 40 years in the wilderness. But God, their, their hearts weren't changed, really, or the ones that, I mean, a lot of them died, but it wasn't like they were renewed and once they left the wilderness, they followed the Lord with all their heart. Like, that wasn't true at all. And as they were on year 39, God wasn't like, well, it looks like their hearts aren't changed, so I'm going to pile on 10 more years. Like, once the consequence was done, it was done. And so I think that we see that throughout Scripture, that the consequence doesn't necessarily change their heart in the moment and keep it from happening again. Yeah, because sometimes it takes them a while just to even process that whole thing. So I heard it stated this way from somebody one time, like, kind of like a police officer, like write a ticket for the offense and then move on. Like don't keep piling things on. Now you may realize, hey, I didn't choose a very good consequence. I'm going to have to do something different next time. But that's kind of on you and you'll learn for next time. So and can I throw out a little Joan Harnsberger tip from sure. 20 years ago? <laughs> uh -oh. um, if you're the consequence for your child is going to negatively impact somebody who had nothing to do with, like, you take away the privilege of going to a birthday party. That's really punishing the child whose birthday it is as much, maybe more, than your child. So being considerate. Um, your mom said that in yeah. Moms and More, like, 20 years ago, and it has stuck with me ever since to yeah. just be thoughtful. Yeah. What is, how does this impact beyond our family? Yeah, you can't always avoid that. And that's also a good lesson for your kids. Like our actions impact other people, but be conscious of how your consequences affect the other people in the fallout zone. Um, okay, so along those lines, if my kid if I give my kid a consequence or we have a situation and my kid is melting down, what do I do? Amy? Not that I always did this, but. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of these stories. <laughs> um, but the best you can, don't react, respond. And so um, it's really easy to let them that get under your skin and react to them and you're just meeting them back with that same energy, you want to stay calm and just respond to them. And um, finally on kid number three, I um, kind of figured that out a little bit. And there was, I remember so clearly, I had fought it with the other kids. You go into Walmart, you put them in the shopping cart, they start screaming because they want to run around like crazy and not be in that shopping cart. And with Will, I remember I put him in there. He starts having this meltdown. Now, you got to be sure that's what it's really about, okay? Like, you don't, you don't want it to be like they're hurt or something. But I knew he's screaming because he wants to get out and run around. And that's just not what we're going to do at Walmart. And so I <laughs> just let him do it. And it was so embarrassing. And people were looking at me like I'm the worst mom on the planet. It lasted what felt like an eternity, but y'all, it was two minutes. Two minutes, and he gave up. Now, not every kid's going to give up that easily, but he really did. And after that, we didn't fight it anymore because he didn't get the response from me that he wanted. It didn't accomplish his goal. He didn't get a reaction from me. And, oh, I wish I'd learned that earlier with my girls just to not react, but but to respond. That doesn't mean I just ignored him. So I wasn't just sitting there letting him cry. I just said, I'm sorry. This, when we're at Walmart, we're going to stay in the cart because mom needs to do her shopping. And so I'm trying to just kind of tell him he's not listening. He's throwing a fit and laying down with the buckle on him and everything else. But I'm just responding, being calm, acting like a normal human being while he acts crazy. Yeah, let me say one other thing about this question, and we're going to kind of shorten it up and move on to some others. But I totally agree, um, you know, 
stay here as much as you can. Don't give in because that means, oh, if I throw a tantrum and I'm screaming and melting down, then I get what I want. Um, I had a kid who, it was literally like once she sort of crossed over the threshold, it was like she couldn't calm herself down. And so once I learned that and we kind of, I realized that it just needed a little bit of time, that was helpful. But realize that typically this is not the time for talking and reasoning with your child. (laughs) Because I've tried to do that and it, it doesn't help things. It just makes things worse because you get more frustrated, they're getting more frustrated. They can't hear what you're trying to say. So if you're at home, like as long as your child is not hurting themselves, just walk away. Like, I mean, I've, I've had kids and seen kids, like, we're in the kitchen and they're laying on the floor screaming and crying, and if I walk away, like, it takes them a minute to realize you're gone. <laughs> but they realize you're gone and they're like, wait. And then they might get up and follow you to wherever you are and, and resume. But um, sometimes just the lack of attention will stop it. Okay, I wanna move on. Um, how do I navigate siblings fighting and yelling at each other? Rachel? Um, so the first thing I would say is that's totally normal, and they're yep. supposed to, and that's okay. They're learning how to navigate relationships, how to set boundaries, how to do it in a safe and unconditional love environment. Um, at the same time, they're learning how to navigate relationships and set boundaries, and so we need to give them some guidance. Um, so there were two things we did with our kids that I would do again, and then there's a whole other list of things I wouldn't do again. Um, The first is we expressed to our kids that we were operating under the assumption that how they treated their siblings was quite possibly how they treated their friends. So when we saw repeated ugliness, hatefulness, rudeness, whatever it was, we pulled back on their social calendar and just said, until I can see you can treat people well, I really don't trust you to be at someone else's house and treating them well. Um, It worked for three out of four. (laughs) One still doesn't care. Um, It's fine. Common theme. It's fine. (laughs) It's fine. It's really not fine. Um, And then we also tried to kind of identify or isolate what was the attitude causing repeated fights. And so in one case, um, one of our boys kept teasing our youngest because she was scared and she would end up in our room a lot at night and he would make fun of her. And so um, for a week, he got to sleep in her room on her top bunk, (laughs) and if you want to see a teenage boy cry every night when he goes to bed, make him sleep with his little sister, (laughs) but he quit teasing her, (laughs) and now they're really, really good friends years later. Um, She loved it, too, but from then on, if he started picking at her, we just had to remind him what would happen if he continued, and he pulled back, so we kind of would force him. We would threaten to get a long shirt, too, those extra large t-shirts and you put you put them in it together yeah it's always <laughs> hate fun that it does make for good pictures uh-huh, yeah uh-huh. so Carrie talk about just kind of helping I mean this is the training ground for your kids for how to work through conflicts how to have relationships all that yeah and conflict resolution takes time um, I don't think any of us are naturally good at it so We just try to work on good conflict resolution, expressing your feelings, listening to each other, listening to understand, and then apologizing for specific things. And that takes time for everyone. Um, I also think that building in some alone time can really help if you have some kids that are introverts, um, because really even if they're not introverts they probably could benefit from some um, alone time but siblings can sometimes feel like ever present and so having that time away can sometimes just help yeah um, my younger two um, one is not very aware of body language and facial expressions that they are making and the other is overly aware so they, um, they fought a lot. And I remember telling them multiple times, one day you guys are gonna be the best of friends if you don't kill each other first. Like I literally thought it might happen. So 
Um, hang in there. Continue to navigate. Don't over-insert yourself. Uh, like Rachel was saying, teach them some good rules. And like Carrie was saying, teach them some good guidelines on how to resolve, how to talk to each other, set some basic ground rules for fighting, but then kind of give them some latitude to figure it out uh, because that's how they learn. Okay, next. Who? How do you battle the peer pressure and cultural pace of what kids are doing and have access to at a younger and younger age? In other words, how do you keep your kids age appropriate? Rachel? So the first thing I would say is don't let fear motivate your decision. It's easy to get scared of the unknown and of all the possibilities and all the things that could go wrong, but we can't let fear dictate how we parent. Um, wisdom and prayer are important. Seek counsel from those that are, I would say, just ahead of you. Because if you get too far ahead, we don't know what's going on. Like, I don't know who the preschool gurus are right now. I don't know what's on PBS right now. You know, I'm too far ahead to tell you how to handle a seven-year-old um, with technology. But I can talk to you about how to handle your 13-year-old or your 17-year-old because I'm close enough to have enough experience so just be mindful of who you're asking advice from. Um, and then be mindful that we can have the best intentions and our kids are still sinful humans. Um, know your child and what situations might cause you to be more strict with some and less strict with others. So listen to their why as well. Um, I was adamantly against Snapchat with our first three. I was absolutely not, absolutely not, absolutely not. And then our fourth, all of a sudden, no one was inviting her anywhere, and she would show up somewhere with us, and there would be like eight friends hanging out together. And we couldn't figure out why she was getting left out and kept saying, are you having conflict at school? Like what? And she was like, I don't know, I don't know. Well, come to find out, they didn't text on their phones. They made all of their plans on Snapchat. So nobody meant to leave her out. She just wasn't on the list of people being invited places. Um, I still don't love Snapchat, but our solution was it's logged in on my phone and her phone, and so I can see every message that she gets, and that accountability hopefully is helpful. But um, it's just, it was unreasonable also for me to expect 20 other parents to change their belief system and their, what they were okay with because I wasn't. And so it was easier for us to find a compromise that addressed my concerns but still allowed her to be involved with her friend group. Yeah, because we have to, as our kids are growing, we have to teach them how to live in this world, mm -hmm. right? We can't just keep them separate and then one day say, okay, you're off to college because that is a recipe for absolute disaster. So we have to teach them how to be in the world but not be of it. Carrie, talk to us a little bit about just y'all's family and thoughts on this. We have tried really hard to help teach our kids how to think and process what they're seeing and the influences around them rather than what to think so that that way they have a framework um, and even it gives them the chance to listen to the Holy Spirit inside of them as they process what's around them. Yeah, um, my last thing that I would say on that, and a friend told me this rule, and I think it's really great. Don't be the first to let your kids do something, but also probably don't be the last. So that just usually seemed like a good guideline for us. That put us in kind of a healthy place. Um, we never wanted to be the first to let our kids do something. And the, if you have other families that you're friends with that you can get on the same page with, man, that helps so much. Because when your kids come and say, say well, everybody's doing this, I could go, really, is Sydney doing that? Is Sophie doing that? Because I know Amy and I have talked and we're on the same page. And so um, that is super, super helpful as well. So speaking of being on the same page, Let's talk for just a minute about how you get both parents on the same page regarding parenting and discipline. Because that can be really tough, especially when you take into account coming from different backgrounds um, and different childhoods. So let's talk briefly about that for a second. Yeah, I do think this one can be really tough. It takes a lot of communication 
And it takes a commitment with your spouse that you are going to be on the same team. And so, like for Marty and I, we are very different personalities. And so I was much more the one that um, was more of a disciplinarian, more paid attention to what the kids were doing. And he's super fun and laid back and just easygoing. And, um, but that meant that he was really good at listening to the kids. He was really good at, at just hearing things from them. And so because we were committed to being on the same team, then when situations came up, we could talk about it and say, okay, is this a situation that requires us to be a little bit stronger in discipline or a little bit more grace-filled and, and engage in that way? And we could work together and we could value what each other brought. He, he knew that he needed kind of some of what I brought and I knew that I needed what he brings. And so that helped us to be able to be on the same team. And then when we couldn't be, then we had people that we knew we could call. And so um, whether it's your bloom leaders or maybe you've had small group leaders in a D group or something else, we knew that we could call those people and say, okay, help us figure out how to handle this. We just don't know. Or we would go, we can go to counseling and ask, you know, help us get on the same page here because we're just not. Yeah. Carrie, talk to us a little bit about y'all's experience with this. Yeah. Um, parenting differently is, was the original catalyst that landed us in counseling. Um, which I'm really grateful for. It helped us process through a lot of just our different um, backgrounds, things that we experienced as kids. And ultimately, we had to learn to communicate better. And um, I had to learn to value what Stephen brought to the table. And like you were saying, and just really feel like it was good that our kids had two very different parents and there wasn't a better way to parent. They actually needed both of us. And once I learned to really value that, and he had to learn to value what I brought to the table as well, it made a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. I think that many times this question and this issue, if you're struggling with this issue, it probably is more an issue of the healthiness of your marriage than it is right or wrong parenting styles. And so the health of your marriage is gonna fluctuate over time, okay? You need to know that. Like, you're gonna go through really good seasons and you're gonna go through seasons of thinking, I don't know if we're gonna make it. But if you're in one of those low points or if you are struggling in your marriage, please, I mean, you're hearing these guys say, counseling, counseling, that's what sent us to counseling, and it helped us. So please don't wait. Don't wait until you've struggled with this and your kids are teenagers, because let me tell you, the pressure of that will end your marriage if you're not really working on the health of your marriage. So don't wait, reach out, reach out to your leader, reach out to me. Just like we talked about last week, we've got the care team here. So um, parenting differences are not typically the only issue that you're struggling with. It's typically a little bit deeper issue in your marriage. To kind of go along with that a little bit, um, struggling, I struggle with anger as a mom. How do I handle this? Amy? Amy? Well, I think that's normal that we feel that. Um, I think it's important to stop and figure out what's triggering that anger. So is it frustration that your kid's not doing what you're asking? Or is it that you maybe just need a break? Maybe you need a, just to slow down for a minute and um, just take a minute to figure out how can I respond rather than react? Um, lots of prayer. <laughs> um, also, I think that there's so many times when I would get frustrated with my kids and not know how to handle situations. And that's when I would call my friends and I would say, okay, talk through this with me. Help me come up with a good strategy so that I don't lose my mind next time, the next time they do this. And so that I can truly respond and not react. Yeah, I think it's really important to think about what is triggering it. Um, we talked about fear. We've talked about control. We've talked about guilt as moms throughout this series. So I think that that is really, really important. And again, it's hard. Ask God to continue to help you identify those feelings 
so that you are not expressing them in anger. Um, we're going to keep moving through. We've got these last couple questions. We're kind of running, running out of time. Um, quickly, let's talk about how do you gauge normal child and teenage behavior, and at what point should a parent go to counseling for help? I think this is really challenging because there is such a wide range of normal. But I have kind of two qualities that I would look at for normal versus kind of outside the bounds of normal for behavior. One is the severity of the behavior. Um, if, you, if the severity of your child's behavior is way outside kind of what all your friends are talking about and you're seeing in other kids, I think that could be a sign that you need some outside help. The other would be the duration of that behavior. We talked about kind of that two and three-year-old phase, like it should get better Teenagers are gonna have real high highs, which means they're gonna have real low lows, but they shouldn't last forever. Like they should kind of swing back again, which is such a fun ride, let me tell you. <laughs> but if they're staying here, or if they're staying real high all the time, like that's not normal. And so I think begin to look at that. What do you guys have to say quickly about that? I do think disobedience is part of our sin nature. And sometimes um, it can indicate something deeper that we're seeking, like love or connection, attention, appreciation, or lacking something like food, sleep, space. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. A nap and a snack always does miracles. Yeah. That's true. I mean, I remember, to, I, th I think, um, stepping back also and looking at a bigger picture of time rather than, you know, just things are not getting better and it's been a whole week. Like, I remember having to tell Chuck, especially with Charlie, so if you have boys, um, I said, okay, we're making progress because here's how boys function. First, they go through the stage of they do something stupid and they never realize that it's stupid, okay? Then... They do something stupid, this is the next stage, they do something stupid, and after the fact, they go, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. That's progress. Like, it doesn't feel like progress because they're still doing, <laughs> real, isn't it? I mean, y'all all have boys. Like, they're still doing the stupid thing. <laughs> then the third stage is they do the stupid thing, but while they're doing it, they start to go, this is a bad idea, guys. And maybe they stop, maybe they don't. I don't know. But in the moment, they realize it. Then finally, and I'm talking like, it takes a long time to get here. Finally, before they do it, they stop and they go, hmm, bad idea. Okay? But, but even those earlier stages, like, that's progress. So sometimes just stepping back and realizing, hey, we are making progress here, even though it doesn't feel like it. Okay, we got to wrap this gig up, but um, as we do that, I want to close with just asking each of you, if you could go back to maybe your early years of motherhood, your kids being young, like, what would you want to tell yourself? Who wants to start? Um, I would say that, um, tell myself that I'm not going to be the perfect mom, and my kids aren't going to be perfect kids, and that's okay. Yeah, because we know that's okay because it makes room for them to need Jesus, right? We got to remember that. Rachel? Um, I'm actually changing my original answer from this week. Go for it. <laughs> um, it kind of piggybacks off of yours, but you're never going to be the mom you want it to be. And that's okay. Some days you're going to be better than you want it to be, and some days you're going to be worse some days you're going to think you had it all figured out, and then your 15-year-old is going to come home and blow that up. Um, but it's okay. You are the mom God chose for that child. However that child came to be yours, you are the mom God chose for that child. So you are the one best suited to love that child. That's really good. Um, yeah, I think I would say to myself, don't stress. Don't get distracted by everything else so much that you miss being intentional and really enjoying your child. Mm, that's good. That's good. Um, I think one of the things that has helped me most is understanding how each of my kids are wired because they're all wired very differently. And in some ways that's similar to me. In some ways it's very opposite. But it has helped me to parent them better 
and to understand them well um, when I understand kind of their wiring and what's driving them. So, and then I would just echo everything you guys said. We're not going to be perfect, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing for you because it drives you to depend on Jesus, and it's a good thing for your kids because it shows them you can't do this on your own, and I can't do this on my own as your mom. We all need Jesus. So thank you guys so much for being here this morning. This is always fun. Yeah. This is always fun doing a panel. Um, I let it run a little bit long this morning because I thought what you guys had to say was really good. So let me pray for us, and then you guys can jog to your small group. God, thank you for this morning and for these women. God, I thank you um, for their successes, but I also thank you for our failures um, as parents, as moms, as just women because they do show us our need for your love, our need for your grace, for your wisdom and your mercy. And so God, I pray for each of these young moms as they are navigating the long, long days of raising their kids and pointing them towards you, trying to raise them into responsible little human beings. Um, And some some days that feels kind of like a lost cause, God. But I thank you that you are with us, that you show us Uh, your rules and your ways, and that they are for our good. So God, we love you and praise you. We just ask for your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed.